Great. So now we turn to our um, uh, our uh, principal speaker this evening, um, and that is Professor Barbara uh, Pearsonek uh, from Anglia Ruskin University. And the title um, is Light, Sight, and Wonders of the Eye. Um, we will learn a little bit about that over dinner. Um, and uh, I'm sure, it, uh, it, yes, um, we, we look forward to something that uh, we all take a deep interest in. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, can everybody hear me? I'm, I'm so pleased because my voice doesn't carry so well. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for the lovely dinner. Um, I, I'm so pleased that so many people are interested in this topic. Um, I, I'm going to start actually with, um, with, a, with a quote. I can make this work. I'm having a problem, James, to moving the slide. Oscar Wilde. I really like the writings of Oscar Wilde. I like going to see plays by Oscar Wilde, but I fundamentally disagree with this statement that a picture is a purely decorative thing. It's a lot more than that. I wanted to start with a place where I've been many years ago. I used to live in Australia. I've been to what used to be Ayers Rock is now Uluru. This is Uluru and this is Uluru. This is all of you. As is this. You can't hear me. Oh. Can you hear me now? No. Nope. Is it is it oh that's much better. Shall I go to the beginning or shall I just keep going? So these are all pictures of Uluru. If I were to ask you, what what is the color of Uluru? The answer is very philosophically, it depends. Depends on the time of the day. It depends on the season. And yes, there can be seasons. And yes, it does rain in the center of Australia. That's where Uluru turns purple. Sometimes it's black. And if you go to that part of Australia, you buy, and you can still buy the postcards, but you can see many, many different images in different colors. So it's not just a purely decorative thing. An image will change. And the impressionists realize that. The Impressionists painted depending on the impression they had of the object, the image, at a certain time of day, a certain season, and so on. And Monet was very good at this. Monet painted many, many objects over and over and over and presented them in different lights, different times. So he painted um, Rouen Cathedral. You see the morning light in midday with the sun shining on it and the evening. The cathedral is a cathedral but how it's changed in color, how it's changed in, in the, the contrast, and how you can almost see three-dimensionality and then a, a, a difference in that, in, in some of the images where the light is fading or where the light hasn't, still, hasn't quite come up. He did the same thing with the very famous Japanese bridge, which he painted in different seasons, and the glorious greens, the colors that came up, the first photo in the photo on the top left, and the lovely golds in the one on the bottom right. Now, I just wanted to, to throw in something for the scientists here. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a picture that you see very often in Prussian Sunrise, one of the first paintings Monet presented. Um, and uh, we see it very often. We see it in all sorts of objects and images and so on. Biscuit tins. Well, this was the, um, this was what a reviewer thought of that image, executed by the infantile hand of a school child who was spreading out colors on any sort of surface for the first time. So when you have your paper rejected or your grant rejected, <laughs> think of Monet. Um, that was Louis Leroy's um, view. And I am not going to show how Monet responded, um, either the French or the English version. Nevertheless, the, the, the point is that a lot of the um, impressionists had eye disease. And Monet had um, a lot of different diseases, but mainly cataract. He was famous for his cataracts, actually, because he painted through them. Um, he, he, he recorded uh, the images he saw, and he was acutely aware he was losing his sight. And he even painted after a very botched cataract operation. Um, the others, um, Degas, we can't still figure out what Degas had. There's papers upon papers written about what he might have had. Was it cataract? Was it retinal disease? Was it, was it a mixture of both? Um, 
Pissarro had a dreadful condition called acrocystitis, which I, I can describe best by showing you the, the picture. It's just a very, very watery, painful eye. But I wanted to then and just take, take a step into what, what is cataract, since most of the impressionists did suffer through cataract. In a healthy eye, um, what is happening is that the light is focused on the back of the retina. And that this sort of, um, I hope this works, this bit here is the lens. It's supposed to be clear, it's supposed to be transparent, and it's supposed to focus light properly so that the image falls on the retina sharply. But as a cataract forms, this is a very, very basic picture. It's not quite like that. But the light is scattered or absorbed, and it does not reach the retina. So what the retina sees is a very mixed image, a blurred image, or no image at all, depending on how advanced the cataract is. So you can imagine what the impressionists were going through, and um, particularly, particularly Monet, who was so diligent with this. So what do cataracts do? The cataract is actually a family of diseases. It's simple to say, well, a cataract is an opacity. It is an opacity, but it can stop the light reaching the retina by scattering it. It can stop it by absorbing it. It can stop it by both. There's also aspects of fluorescent where the light that comes in on one wavelength is then sent out in another wavelength. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, but in, in, in the main scattering or absorption. So when I described this, I used to go to, to my, my son was very young, I used to go to his school in Australia and talk about science. I used to describe um, light and vision. And this is a very simple way of showing it. So if you take a glass of water and you, and you put an X underneath it and the, the water is clean and clear, you can see the X. So this is a clean, transparent lens. If you were to drop a couple of a couple of drops of tea, it's always the best. Um, it immediately gets very dark, but you can still see the X quite well. It's got to be very very dark before you stop seeing the X. So that's that's the cataract that absorbs. It's got to be very very dark. And generally, in in the developed world, we don't get cataracts that get to that length at that, that level. They they're usually operated on before then. The more common ones are the cataracts that are scattered. Again, if you take that glass of water with the X, and you drop only a couple of drops of milk in there, very quickly, it turns cloudy. And very quickly, the X is not visible. Now, it's still, there's no color in there. It's still lightish, but you can't see it because the light is being scattered. You can't see the X through it. So these are pictures of cataracts, various different cataracts. And I don't know if anyone's ever seen, looked through somebody else's eye. But if you are a clinician and you look into an eye, you, you see images that are, this is the lens, a little bit of cataract there, tiny bit, this is an absorption type cataract, so it's a bit yellow. A pacification here, much, much more yellow, and then bits and pieces of cataract all the way through, scattering cataracts, an assortment of different, different varieties, but they do impair vision. So as Monet painted progressively through his cataracts, um, his paintings, you could say they deteriorated, but actually, um, to me, they're fascinating because it presents the image of something seen in a different way. The, the uh, object becomes more blurred. If you didn't know there was a Japanese bridge there, you probably couldn't pick it from that, that picture on the bottom, bottom right. But the colors are brighter and, and, and the blobs of color are perhaps a little bit more dense. And art critics would say perhaps it's a different genre. Um, perhaps it is. Um, but it is really a sight through a cataract design. This always, this always moves me when, when Monet wrote about it and said that he could no longer see reds with the same intensity. They, they look muddy, pinks, insipid, and the intermediate colors escape me entirely, which is so difficult for an artist. So how does the world look through a cataract? If you are um, going for an eye examination and, and the clinician that's looking into your eye tells you you have a cataract, that clinician has based that diagnosis on what they have seen from the light that's come back from your eye, the light reflected back from your eye. The light that goes through your eye to reach the retina is seen by you. So that's the bits that the clinician isn't seeing. So sometimes um, the clinician can look into an eye and it looks a little bit, um, well, I wouldn't say cruddy, perhaps that's not word to use, but not, not clear. And you think that patient's vision is probably not very, very good. And yet the patient surprisingly has better vision than you expect. And conversely, the opposite. Sometimes a lens can look 
almost clear, but the patient's vision is bad. So we, some, some time ago, got my, my first research council grant when I came back from Australia was an EPSRC grant on how does a cataract actually alter vision? What is it that the patient sees? I, it took a lot of mathematical modeling and I'm not going to go through that and scatter theory. And we had a brilliant Russian mathematician and I'm very grateful to, to Sergei Bogobrodov for what he did for us with this. So we, we, we modeled um, what we thought, we took a screen, a, 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 an image of, of what we imagined would be a screen presented to a patient. And we put in lots of different types of images of lots of different types of shapes, which you would not see in an eye clinic because it would not be much use to a, to a clinician. And we then model what would happen if light was scattered. And you can see that, although you can still see bigger images like the W, it's very, very difficult to see the smaller ones. Some of the stars just look like blobs. Um, some of them you can see a little bit, but it's much, much harder. On the other hand, if you, you take the kind of cataract, model the kind of cataract that is absorbing light, you actually can see the images more clearly in the sense of making them out. It just looks like you're looking through a fog. So then we, we, we thought we'd have a little bit of fun with the impressionists and we tried to maybe figure out what they were seeing. Um, and so we, we looked at, this is just a bit of fun, this isn't science. Um, we, we thought, well, did Monet have a scattering cataract or an absorption cataract? We looked at the water lilies he painted. It's close to his cataract getting quite mature. And we thought, well, it's losing a little bit of the, um, the shape of the flowers, the water lilies, perhaps a little bit of the color. So possibly more of a scattering cataract, whereas a little bit like that one. Whereas if you look at, um, this is a couple of the impressionists who very rarely get a mention, um, female impressionist, Mary Cassatt's work. She used to paint beautiful detail. Um, the lace on the Spanish dancer is, is, is so intricate, so specific. Mary Cassatt had also had a cataract, we believe, and it becomes a little bit more, you can still see the details, but perhaps more of an absorption type cataract. It's as if you're looking, look at the facial features of the young woman compared to the facial features of the Spanish dancer, perhaps a little bit more foggy. So perhaps a bit more like an absorption cataract, but we, we're not saying either way. So what, what, does, um, what does it all depend on? It depends on the lens of the eye. And all lenses bend light. That's what they're supposed to do. These are human lenses way back many, many years ago from my PhD thesis, when I used to do ray tracing to measure the refractive index of the lens, to measure the, the properties of the lens. Used to pass rays through these, through these lenses and then try to figure out what it is, what is happening inside the lens um, to bend the, the light this way. But very briefly, if you have a, a thin lens, it bends light less, so the rays focus at a further distance. And if you have a thicker lens, it bends light more sharply, and it's a closer distance for focusing. But that isn't everything. It also depends on the material of, of the lens, depends on the density. So again, this is a great one to do with school children. You, you take a glass of water, put in a pencil, and it bends, and it fascinates them. But of course, the pencil isn't bent. It's just that the light rays coming out of the water into the air are refracted. Um, so it depends very much on the medium in which the light is traveling. But when I used to teach um, optics, I used to tell my students, if you were sitting on a light ray and you were going through water, you'll go through straight. If you're going through air, you will go through straight. If you're going through diamond, you will travel straight. You travel straight until you reach an interface where there is a change in density. That is where the light ends. And this is the fascinating thing. Um, if you have lenses with a high refractive index, they will bend light more, of course. Lenses with a lower refractive index will bend light less. These are homogeneous index lenses. The fascinating one is the gradient index lens. So lenses with a constant refractive index will bend the light at the interface. The rays enter the lens, they change the direction, the rays exit the lens, they change the direction again. In a gradient index lens, where the density is progressively changing within the lens, the rays of light are bending as they go through. And that bottom image here, uh, here is a bovine lens, again, from my PhD thesis. And I don't know whether you can see it, but those rays are ever so gently bending as they go through the lens. And the biological lens is a gradient index lens. 
based partly on the fact that it's created by cells that grow on other cells and so on in the concentration of proteins, but actually it's because it, it produces a far more superior image on the back of the eye. If you have a gradient index lens, the quality of imagery is so much better. The rays are focused more sharply, you avoid aberrations, you avoid a lot of blur. So how do you measure it though? So when I started on my PhD and I was I actually started, would you believe, in protein chemistry. And I wanted to find out how the proteins create the optics. I was told it's going to be impossible to measure the refractive index because it's gradient and it's really difficult. And around about that time, a group of scientists were, were coming up with, particularly uh, lady called Melanie Campbell, was coming up with a way of doing this through mouse lenses and following the ray tracing results, the ray tracing methods that Melanie and her team were using. I traced uh, many, many lenses. and measured through mathematics and from the from the light going in the light coming out and the rays coming out of the, the angles coming out uh, what the refractive index might be and so we were getting these nice parabolic differences in refractive index and so from the edge of the lens here to the middle of the lens the density and refractive index goes up and then it goes back down again however this is too perfect Nothing in biology is that perfect. It's perfect like this and perfectly shaped because it's, it's gone through mathematics, it's gone through assumptions, it's gone through that, that sort of cleaning that mathematics can sometimes do. I wasn't particularly satisfied with that. Um, it gave us an idea of the shape and it gave us an idea of the magnitude of the density changes. However, I went on to develop a, a fiber optic refractometric sensor. Um, I wanted to see what's going on in localized areas of the lens. I didn't want the assumptions to, to maybe wash out or dilute out what the refractive index might be. So I was able then to probe with a small sensor um, right all the way through the lenses. Yes, it was slightly invasive because it was very, very thin needle was going through the lens, but I was able to measure refractive index profiles that to me were more realistic. So this one here is a 53-year-old human lens and it's, oops, um, actually goes up and then is relatively flat in the center of the lens and then down again. So the human lens doesn't have much of a gradient. And then these were the, this was a conglomeration of different bovine lenses put together. A bit more satisfying for a biologist because they scatter on them. However, even that wasn't really good enough. And then around um, probably 12 years ago, I was lucky enough to make contact with the Spring 8 synchrotron in, in Japan. And the Japanese researchers there were, were interested in refractive index of the lens. And they had developed a method of measuring that on the, in the synchrotron, and they wanted to probe this a bit more. So I went over, it was 2011, probably my first visit, and I've been going annually ever since, apart from the COVID years when we did our experiments online, but we, we have been lucky enough to go have experiments every, every year. And for anyone who may not know what a synchrotron is, it's, it's just charged particles that emit very, very high density radiation and it's that sharp, really, really sharp X-ray source um, that we use to measure the refractive index. But why go to Spring 8 when you can go to the Diamond or you can go to Grenoble or you can go to Synchrotrons much closer to home? Because um, in Spring 8, they have this X-ray Talbot grating interferometer developed by a scientist called Mamos. And this particular grating interferometer measures the density changes very, very accurately. Um, so you, you put your sample in here. It rotates so you can measure it in three dimension. It goes through a phase grating, an absorption grating. And from the fringes that are then analyzed, we can get density maps. And from those density maps, we can calculate refractive index. The beauty is you can do it in three dimension. You can, do it, you can see the lens within the eye. And you can get down to very, very accurate measurements that you couldn't possibly do with any other method. So my first visit there, we looked at a, a range of different animal lenses. So the, the porcine lens, reinine, reinine frog lens, mouse, uh, newt, and, and fish lens, a goldfish lens. The first thing it tells you is that the lens in the eye um, changes enormously in, uh, compared to the eye, eye size. So you can see that the frog lens has a, the frog has a massive lens, as does the mouse, uh, and the pig has a comparatively small lens compared to the eye size. And the shapes are different as well. Some lenses are round, some lenses are more elliptical. So when we started to look at these, the first thing that we noticed were these rings. And when I was talking to um, Japanese scientists, there, he said, well, 
this might be an artifact. So we may need to look at this again. And we looked at it again, and we looked at it again, and these rings were coming up. So what are these rings? Uh, we thought we would have a smooth gradient. We didn't expect to have a step. So we didn't expect to have these discontinuities. However, I remembered something from way back in, in the human lens. I'd, I'd studied it as, as a student. And that is that if you look into a healthy human lens, healthy human lens, no cataract, you will see what have been called zones of discontinuity. The, this picture here is um, an anatomical drawing. So it's perhaps a little sharper than it should be. And this is, this is a real image of a human lens. And these zones are black, it's white, black, white, white, light, dark, light, dark. And then the central dark line, which has been called a suture, it isn't really a suture, but it's been called a suture. And these features are seen in healthy lenses because the cataract doesn't mask them. And they've been labeled, you know, different stages of growth. Some people call the central bits, you know, the fetal, fetal part of the lens, an embryonic lens. And there are, there have been um, arguments in the, in the literature as to what you should call these different zones, but that doesn't really matter. The interesting thing is that these features are there. We never really knew what they were. And suddenly these discontinuities we were seeing here, or these, these rings, made me think, well, could it be related? Could it be that lenses grow like trees? They grow with cells overlaid on top of the lens and this tissue accrual is simply growing layers over and over other layers. So in a sense, it follows the growth pattern. But could we relate these discontinuity, these discontinuities to, to refractive index? So we measured many, many uh, human lenses, over a hundred, and we found the refractive index contours in them. This is, this is from, from um, it's probably four or five years of, of experimenting. And we, we found that these contours, so that they are more dense in the center. I know they look lighter, but the refractive index is, is more dense in the central contour. They change with age, they change with the shape of the lens. But when we started to model these and we, we looked at how these refractive index contours, if you look at them through the optical axis, which is here, how the refractive index is increasing and then relatively constant in the center and then decreasing. If we then tried to model what a clinician was seeing, so they're sending the light in, the light is bouncing off the different parts of the lens and creating this image of discontinuities. So we model that. I'm grateful to Mehdi Barami, my postdoc then, who was a genius mathematician, I could not have done this. Um, he modeled based on our refractive index contours and based on what the clinicians might be seeing and found that actually we can mimic these zones of discontinuity. So based on from our reflectometric analysis. So this was our model here, and this is a human lens of roughly the same age. Of course, ours is sharper, it's mathematical. The human, the human lens, living lens, you're looking through the cornea, so you're seeing all sorts of other, other um, possibly light reflected back. But the, couple, the features that, that remain is this, this, I'm not positioned this very well, this suture, this dark line in the middle, you can see that here, which is characteristic, oops, I'm not keeping this straight, characteristic of a refractive index gradient. And also these lines, these light and dark lines do not align. So what might be light in the, in the anterior of the lens is dark in the posterior of the lens. And that's seen in the living lens as well. So we were able to explain zones of discontinuity from the refractive index gradient, which was again, a nice fun piece of work. But, but what, what does it mean? So are these zones of discontinuity really linked to growth rates like you might see in the rings of a tree? And if that's the case, could you possibly date a person's growth? Could you possibly predict um, something about their health? Perhaps predict something about um, longevity? All these questions were floating around in, in, in our heads and really you need a longitudinal study from very early development because most of the lens growth is in early development begs the next question can you measure the development of a very very small lens it starts in the human to develop around second stage of gestation it's very very tiny can, can you really get to that level with our early techniques no but with the x-ray interferometer we found that we could go down to lenses of 0.2 millimeter diameter and possibly less so we started Actually, we started with zebrafish, but we've gone on to measure chicken, chicken lenses in embryonic development. Um, 
this is E is embryonic day. So we've gone from embryonic day 10 to embryonic day 18. We, we find that even at embryonic day 10, there is a gradient of refractive index. It increases in magnitude and it broadens. We've actually done embryonic day four and six in our, in our studies, but we haven't, we haven't yet done, analyzed them. There is no index gradient at embryonic day four. It's a mess, so it starts to develop later. But it tells us something about, about that growth. If we go onto the zebrafish lens, here we're looking at days post-fertilization. We've got down to 15 days post-fertilization. These are very tiny little lenses, very tiny little, little eyes. And yet you can see that refractive index blip, very, very smooth, very, very nice. In fact, it was a, too perfect a profile and when, I, when I first saw it. And then as it grows and grows, you get onto an old zebrafish of 880 days post-fertilization. The, the refractive index gradient is broader, plateau in the center, interestingly, takes on the more plateau sort of central region that we see in the human and continues to, to grow. So that was very interesting. We then started to model this in three dimensions to see whether we could see anything three dimensionally that we couldn't see in two dimensions. So we have um, here are the contours if you, as if you're looking through through a cut, a cut through here. And here is the, the whole three dimensional refractive index gradient. So that was interesting. And um, then we went on to mice lenses and we started to look at where they developed. So this gave us a picture of species development and where the refractive index starts to form in the different species and how that might tell us something later on about these zones of discontinuity. The mouse, of course, is very different. The mouse lens tends to have this sort of peak here. Um, sorry, I'm not pressing this hard enough. Almost like, you know, those jellies you make and it has a sort of a bottom and then it has this, sorry, not using this very well, uh, a, almost a, um, a kink at the top. So there's almost like a two-stage growth there. And then we, we thought, well, you know, this is a developmental side and we're still working on that. What about the other end of the scale as the lens gets older and develops cataract? Is it possible to analyze cataract and to see cataract? If you try to do this with ray tracing, it's impossible because what will happen, the cataract will either scatter or will absorb the light coming in. However, with the X-ray methods, we could do that. We have been able to measure gradient index defects and we have been able to find them in old lenses and in mutant lenses. The first ones we found were in old humans. These were clearly cataract as lenses. These, this, this bit here, and this bit here, and this here, and this here is a cataract. So these are opacifications that are happening. In this individual 88 year old human lens that the sight would have been pretty poor. He might have just, or she might have just seen through the optic axis, but there wouldn't have been a fair bit of scatter here because that is a break in the index gradient, so there would have been a scatter. When we looked at this um, from very old zebrafish lenses, these are not um, abnormal lenses. These are normal, but very, very old. And nearly 2,000 days post-fertilization is incredibly old for a zebrafish. So we looked at them through, through um, this is in vivo in the eye, and then bright field and dark field microscopy, and then this was the, the contour. And here you see a slight kink, so slight kink on the outside there. And where I've got the arrows, I'm really not managing this very well. Where we've got the arrows, there's slight opacifications. And you can see a few little opacities. There's one here, and there's a few here on the edges of these. That, there's one there, that whitish bit on the top. But this is actually still pretty good for, for, for a, um, a very, very old lens. We then um, started to look at mutations that we know mimic human cataracts. So in, in the lens, you have crystalline proteins. They're the bulk of the lens. You also have the water um, channel proteins, the aquaporin proteins, and they're the ones that let the water in through the lens and keep it, and nutrients in through it, and, and keep it, keep it um, alive in a sense, because the lens doesn't have any living cells in the center. It doesn't have any blood vessels. So it has no other form of nutrition, but to get the water and the nutrients in through, and the aquaporins do that. So with mutations in aquaporin A, we were finding really dreadful, dreadful contours. I mean, there was, they were asymmetric. There were opacities throughout the lens. There were lumps and bumps in all the wrong regions. This was a, these are pretty, pretty bad lenses. And the sight of that zebrafish would have been dreadful. I mean, there would have been absorption. There would have been scatter, particularly here. 
this is this is this is a dreadful 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 looking lens and you can see the opacification here and here but aquaporin b which is another type of water channel proteins with mutations in aquaporin b the gradient index profiles were not too bad there were a little bit of a little bit of opacity on the side but actually pretty close to the wild type lenses so we was this is this is interesting because we thought the aquaporins together needed to be um intact and yet it seems that aquaporin b although the, the lenses did grow at a much slower rate the aquaporin b did not aquaporin b mutants did not have the devastation that aquaporin a mutants had and then we started to um i was quite fortunate to to start working with Eddie Colu Shandley in, in in washington university and there were um, Lanisterol had been had um, sort of made the news in 2015 as a potential anti-cataract um, treatment, and it had been looked at in animals, but nobody had done the optics of it. And so that, that we were approached, and would we like to have a look at the optics of the lens? Because although uh, you know you may you may think a cataract is dissolved, it goes back to what the clinician sees inside. If the optics, it may look like a, like a clear lens, but the patient still may not see well. So if the optics is intact it's still not a viable treatment. So what, um, what we did in these experiments with the with mice um, but with, with cataracts had um, an anti, this anti-cataract compound put into one of their lenses and not into the other, in one of their eyes and not into in the other. And then we measured the treated and the untreated eyes at, at, at spring eight. And we actually found in 46% of them, quite drastic changes, because you would expect to have similar cataracts in both eyes. You would expect that. And in fact, um, the untreated mice here, you can see where the arrows, arrows are, that there are these, these kinks, these bumps, these, these dark regions here. That's an opacity. A little bit here, but um, more or less uh, a much clearer profile. Similarly with this one, there's a, a really big opacity here in this mouse nothing in the fellow eye and in this one um, opacity there and an opacity there very little left in the in the treated eye so uh, this is something um that's uh, sort of made the media i'm not claiming i found this i'm claiming we've measured the optics of it and we found something that is very interesting um getting funding for further work has not been easy we're still working on this and i'm working on a range of different types of anti-cataract drug because i do believe that there is a, an opening there. I also don't think that one type of compound will cure all cataracts. I think there are a family of diseases and what might be helpful for one cataract may not be for another cataract. So it's not gonna be the panacea for everything. There will still be a uh, need for surgery, but it definitely is something that, that we need to investigate further. The, the fascinating thing for me is that I always thought, and when I was doing my PhD, and proteins and I we, dis we discuss protein aggregation and, and, and misaggregation and protein folding and all these diseases that once it happens once a protein misfolds that's it it's irreversible it's possible that's not entirely true and that's the fascinating part of this I want to just end a little on on going back to the biology so this is what really fascinates me not that we get cataract um why we don't get it earlier we have these crystalline proteins they so elegantly maintain the gradient of refractive index that the, the, the lens grows by having this fiber cell accrual on the, on the outside. It has exactly the right concentration of proteins all the way through to make this gradient of index. Now that's fascinating. Why does it change with age and development? How does it change across species? And how does it manage to make sure that it meets the visual demands of the animal? Yeah. So I wanted to, I look, look a little at these crystallines and this is this this is the smallest and least complicated crystalline in the human lens the gamma crystalline this is a family of crystallines but the smallest and the alpha crystalline is huge and massive but gamma gamma crystalline was crystallized by Sir, Sir, Sir Tom Blundell in in Oxford and I have to say this is what inspired me to go into working in the lens so this is a a protein I can see it's a fairly, it's a Greek key structure, but it's still fairly complicated. Now, this is a crystal. You can maybe call it sodium chloride, but you can see how, how well organized it is. Doesn't matter which, which way you go, the spacing is exactly the same compared to gamma crystalline. Now, we call the lens a crystalline lens. Well, 
This is what a crystal does if you put it between cross polarizers, quartz and calcite, because it is so well organized and it has what they call long range order. You get these beautiful patterns, the crosses, the isogyres and the isochromatics. And depending on how birefringent the crystal is, how, how organized it is, you get more and more rings and different colors. Now, by accident, I found this in eye lenses. Um, I was very young and um, I, I was very excited. I, I Basically, it was an accident. I, I was bored with what I was doing. I went down to the Bailey Library in Melbourne University and I was just to go down to the, the, part, um, the part of the library where you got the very, very old manuscripts. Um, and I found an old book that said you can actually cure cataract if you do this particular histological technique if you put the lens through the histological process so you, you fix it and then you go through pulling out the water and then you clear it so i did this um and why i put it between cross polarizers i don't know but i did and i found these crystal structures this is counterintuitive if you have taken the water out of the lens and the lens is about 35 percent human lens 35 percent protein and the rest is water, you think you would have damaged the structure of those proteins. And yet, this is what I found. So um, I published it as a letter because nobody was really interested. And I thought, wow, I've made a really big discovery. Um, I was so pleased with myself. And then I remember something I was told by a professor um, many years ago, who said, if you think you made a discovery, you probably haven't searched the literature properly. And how right he was. Mm -hmm. I went back to the Bailey Library. I looked up polarized lenses. I found David Brewster had done exactly the same thing in 1833. So there went the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I was really despondent about that. And I thought, why? And then, then, then um, one of my supervisors said, you know, I wouldn't be so despondent about that. Um, great minds think alike. But this was an accidental discovery. And what does it mean? What does it mean that the structure of the lens with these complicated proteins, not only forms an index gradient, but once you pull the water out and all you have is the protein backbone, you, cre you create this. So the top one is, a, I've never been able to do it in a human lens, I said that. This is a bovine lens, this is a rat lens, and this is um, a lens you won't find in this country. It's a blue eye trevally, it's an Australian fish. The fish is about this big and the lens is the size of a golf ball. Um, so interesting. And um, that's what fascinates me. This is what keeps me awake at night. How can these proteins with such complicated structures produce something that is, that is as transparent and stays so transparent all these decades? I mean, you, you tend to find you have cataract in your sixth decade, seventh decade. Well, those lenses have been in your, the, cent, the ones in the center of your lens have been inside your lens for as long as you have, plus about six months, because they started in gestation before you, you were born. So that's pretty old for proteins. And, and why and how on earth we have these remarkable structures that you find in highly ordered crystals. There's something there I'm missing. So this is the lady that inspired me when I was eight years old. She comes from the same country. I come in Polish. Maria Skłodowska Kui um, inspired me because I, I read about her life story and I found she, she never gave up. She never ever gave up. So I guess I'm not giving up either. Um, and I, I like this quote that all my life, so the new sights of nature made me rejoice like a child. We, we really are novices, no matter how long we've been at us. Um, and that is, I will end on that. Yeah. Oh, th th thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, lovely visuals um, and uh, a lot of uh, fascinating, rather profound information. Um, I'll put that somewhere. Right. Just a, I'm sure we've got lots of questions. I can see one. Uh, yes. Why is that? Put that there. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. This was very interesting. Uh, I would like to know um, why don't we have achromatic aberration with our eyes when there's a single lens instead of several lens like in, on a camera. Uh, is it because of the because the lens has a gradient of index? And 
is um, same question for other aberration like for instance uh, camera lens the, the good quality camera lens they are not spherical but they are aspherical and uh, how are all these aberration corrected in the natural eye with only a single lens and is it because of this gradient of index well we do have chromatic aberrations that's a really excellent question we do have chromatic aberrations in the eye and we do have other aberrations some of the aberrations of the lens are compensated by the cornea so that these again another fascinating structure that the, the two compensate each other um you, you can uh, the, the brain also filters filters out so yes you're right we do have chromatic aberration because of course you're going to get the different wavelengths bending in different directions um but we seem to manage to be able to see through that although in an old-fashioned way um i was told to think this through uh, of measuring whether somebody is myopic or hyperopic was with a with a candle and whether you saw more whether you saw red within a blue ring or blue within a red ring told you where the red and blue lights were focusing so that was a very old 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 I mean, old-fashioned way 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 and um, before you had you had fancy instruments but yes we do have chromatic aberration yes we compensate for it and the lens the lens does, does some of that so, so uh, processing. and some of it's a brain yes yes the lower refractive index lenses have less chromatic aberration than higher refractive index. Yes. The season here it's quite a small refractive index we have a fairly yeah, compared to other animals we do have a fairly low refractive index so we go to about one point does that means anything 1.42 in the center 1.43 when you're looking at some of the um lenses like mice rats one point some of the fish 1.55 1.56 so so the, these these are pretty crystalline proteins with not a lot of water in to get to yes. such a high refractive index. Yes, they're very hard. So uh, before I can see an, another handout, can I just put my question in, which is why on earth would nature complicate things by making um, uh, lenses birefringent? Because that causes all sorts of problems which one wouldn't design in. Is, is, that, is that just a, a, a side effect of the, the, the crystalline organization? Exactly. Um, yeah. That's a that's a good question. We we don't have enough birefringence to to see double, but we have a lamellar structure in the cornea. We right. have a lamellar structure yeah. in the lens, and there is also some birefringence of the retina. But it's okay. only very so very we, we, small. We, which is the the axes for the birefringence? It actually depends. Um, you see what they call Hadinger's brushes. If you can see them, you, you some people have them in this direction, some in that direction. Depends on the the nerve fibers in the retina. Okay, That's I have a good a, question. I thought of that one too. <laughs> online question from Andrew Shepherd: Is there a reason for the constant index midsection, the plateau? Uh, I think there is um, in in the human because the human lens. I didn't talk about this, but the human lens, up until sort of fifth, sixth decade of life, accommodates, so it changes its shape. Mm -hmm. It's got to be soft enough to do that. In the hard lenses with a very, very high refractive index in the center, they can't accommodate. And the reason we accommodate and change shape is so we can see different distances. And then you get to a certain age where your arms grow too long and you can't do that. So the center section has got the high refractive index and then the outer sections are lower refractive index and probably index. softer because they've got more water in. That's right. And those are the ones that do the accommodation. Well, or those are the bits. That's, that's something that's still being, being investigated. The, some, some, some results have shown that in fact, when the lens changes its shape, it's the, the plateau that increases and the cortical gradient remains the same as others have shown differently. So it's something we're still investigating. Another question. I, actually, that was partly the question I was going to ask you, but as a, as a slightly diversionary question, um, I'm not sure this is your field, but creationists have always regarded the eye as the absolutely slam dunk reason why uh, creation is right and evolution is wrong. Have you got any comments on that? Well, um, I, 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 um, I'm not, well, I was going to say I'm not God, um, but <laughs> it depends very much on what, I, I think we evolve, I, I, I think it's, it, it's, you evolve to, to, to meet the demands of what you need. So if I look, if I look at the eye across different species, the, the, the lenses all have refractive index gradients, 
but they vary enormously in magnitude and shape. The lenses vary in size and so on, depending on what this, the species needs. So yes, some, some fish do have very high chromatic aberration, but they're deep, they're deep in the water, perhaps that's, a, that's something they need for sensing. So, um, I mean, I believe in God, so I believe there must be some higher designer out there, but I also believe that there has been an evolutionary process to, 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 to meet what is needed. You know, what is needed for that eye? So, so the eye is not a fixed thing. It can respond to um, <laughs> local drivers. Yes. But the question is where it came from in the first place. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, it's an interesting thing, though, because there are certain crystallines that have evolved from, from enzymes in some fish, and we're not quite sure. And just so I could talk about that again. And the, the, a couple of amino acid changes, just a couple, have changed completely how, that, how much refractivity that protein can do. Now, there had to have been some sort of evolutionary process in that. Robin. I've heard it said that the eye has uh, evolved and re-emerged many times, perhaps 20 times in evolutionary history. Now, is the lens always the same composition um, chemically? Because that would be quite interesting if it was. Uh, it's, they're crystalline proteins, but they're not always the same crystalline proteins. So Sorry, or, always. They're not the always the same crystalline proteins. So, for same. example, yeah. um, uh, fish have an S crystal, and ducks have what we call a delta crystal. I mean, these are names given, but they are different. They're different in their amino acid structure and their secondary structure, and so on. So, no, they're not the same. And they, they confer different optical properties, and possibly different biomechanical properties as well. Can I ask a clarification that you showed your little profiles of refractive index that sort of you know, a sort of uh, rise from the edge to the sort of plateau and then falling away. And you also showed those images with the banding. Um, and I got a little confused as to whether the two were the same thing or whether one was the effect of optics, the optical effect of the other. You mean the human ones? Uh, well, I, whatever. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so the 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 profiles that I showed is just going along the optic axis. Right. The contours that I show is if you cut the sagittal plane through and you're mm -hmm. looking at, so it's one is um, sort of a one dimension, the other one is a two dimensional okay. thing. And then a three dimensional right. one to show the, the peaks. Right, there's a lot of, yes. Okay. Can I take, we've got two, two of the both, actually. Yes, and three, okay. right, the questions are coming, right. Thank you for explaining how uh, the protein uh, develops the uh, problems of the clarity and the lens. Um, I'm rather interested with all these wonderful eye washes and instead of burdening the NHS with wonderful cataract treatment, is there, uh, are you working on something where we can get an eye wash which will wash the cataract away? Like protein, how should we editing, whatever you might call it? Uh, I mean, <laughs> right, I wish I could wash a cataract away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Without, yeah, there must be some research going on to counteract this uh, fogging of the art, basically. We, we, we are, we are yeah, trying to do something. Is, is there that possibility? I think the there is. I think there is. I think there is. It just. Getting funding for it is not being easy, but I think I think there definitely is. There are there's certainly ways of, of reversing some of that detrimental aggregation because so we're certain the proteins aggregate, therefore clumps these clump these, these clumps then scatter light and that's it. So the, the animal possible. models you showed that the, the, the deformation was around the edge. These were scattering type cataracts yeah. from the edge, yeah. Yes. Right. <clears throat> Are cataracts a result of damage to the DNA that's producing the the changes in the eye, and is that associated with ultraviolet or other, or simple brightness of the 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 light, the light that's entering the eye? Are those correlated? Really, really interesting question. So, first of all, um, the 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 lens forms by the sort of this epithelial cells, like the stem cells of the lens. They they differentiate into these fiber cells. And then after a certain point, 
the nuclei become pyknotic. So these cells do not have DNA in them. That's it, they, they're inert. It's just the protein that stays there. Um, and your second question, your second part of your question was, is it ultraviolet light? That, that's um, fairly, fairly debatable. So it was always thought that light does damage, and too much ultraviolet light does damage. And then um, some years ago, there was a study, I mean, more than some years ago now, um, a couple of decades ago, that there was a big study done in Chesapeake Bay on fishermen who were exposed to light. And they, they didn't actually find the, the correlation with ultraviolet that they thought. Um, so it's not as clear cut as, as that. So, so ultraviolet, would, would, would that sort of cause darkening rather than scattering? Well, it's it's difficult to say. You can you can create a cataract in the lab through pumping it with ultraviolet light. You can do that, and it's been done. But it's it's artificial. And does that equate to somebody who has a long term small amounts of UV? Because um, well, if, if you expose yourself to high amounts of UV, uh, of course you, you you largely through heating because you're going to heat the lens with that light, and it's the heating that causes the aggregation. <clears throat> My question is slightly off piece. So it's um, presbyopia, so changes oh. of stiffening the lens as, as we get older. Um, does your research or related research help us to understand that at the, at the molecular level? I have a, um, a doctoral training center on optics and biomechanics of the, of the lens I have with other collaborators on just that to try to understand um, presbyopia. You know, it's something that we thought was such a simple thing. The lens is just stiffening it, so it can't change its shape, and therefore it can't can't focus for different distances. But it's actually more complicated than that, um, because some of it's to do with the geometry, and there's a big controversy around two theories at the moment. Um, Helmholtz, who said that the lens is simply not able to change its shape because it's it's, it's stretched by these ligaments, and the tension on these ligaments is always in the same direction. And Ron Schacker. Ron is, is still alive, I know Ron quite well, who's actually tackled, has challenged that theory, who says that actually that's not entirely so, and it might be possible that um, presbyopia can, um, can be treated. There are also, there are also treatments and, and well, suggestions that perhaps some of these compounds can soften the lens, um, and possibly it's that softening, because it's, it's a mixture of everything. It's, the lens is getting harder, the lens is getting rounder. Um, the way the zonules pull on it, um, is harder because of, you know they've got less there's less space in the eye so it's it, it's it's more complicated than that yeah, but it's a good question and and there was a thinking that cataract and presbyopia are linked I'm not quite sure I believe that I think one is physiological and one is pathological that's my my opinion so, this, I hadn't appreciated that the these lenses are variable index gradient index gradient um I mean that you you're saying that that produces a better quality of focus. Um, has that been replicated with artificially? Can we? Can you mean? Can you get a great index implant? Well, no, no. But, yeah. but when you just look at a camera lens, I mean, the, it's not that difficult to do a layer by layer growth of a piece of glass. Possibly, I, I don't know if it's done with with glass lenses. Um, hmm. If anyone can 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 do that, it would be fascinating. Perhaps you could produce a viral fringe at lens. So, and so do, do we think this, the, the nature has done it because it makes a better lens or because it's a sort of accident of how it assembles the proteins? That, that's a question. That's the question. It's yeah. growing in this way and it's creating these proteins. And is it is it accidental or is it, or is it you know, and, and, even, and, in the, and the growth, I mean, is, it, is the growth, continue, well, it, it's slower with, as you get into adult life, but is it stepped as the lens is growing through its, its most rapid phase or is it is it continuous? And yeah. what's that telling us? John. Uh, one comment, I urge you to continue your research on presbyopia, which is a total <laughs> nightmare. Um, but uh, um, what was I going to say? As uh, you, you showed the crystalline nature of the dehydrated yes. lenses, has anyone done um, x-ray crystallography or such like to resolve the uh, crystal type of those? More, more conventional uh, lenses that water has been pulled out of. Yes. Yeah. Not, not that I'm aware of. I, I tried to do that with, with some of them and they kind of crumbled. I wasn't able to do that. But I do have one of those lenses from way, way back, maybe over 20 years old. And I took it to the to the beam to see if I could see anything. The density of the proteins was so high that they went through the roof. They couldn't see the top of it. So the answer is no. Um, but it, it, 
it's probably worth doing. The thing is, people are not that interested in it. So you've created lenses, you know, that, that produce these patterns that crystals produce. And so what? But it, it could but tell you something of the nature well, of yes. the proteins. Yeah, well, I, I would think, yeah. yeah. Okay, With the protein you. backbone without the water in it, yes. I lost it. Just, Just an observation, but um, I mean, you probably know this, but if you take starch grains from raw potato and put them under cross polaroids, you see a similar pattern. So I suppose, I don't know. It's, but maybe it's a form by isn't it? It's form and, and the, the, I, the layered structures. It's, but starch doesn't, you don't make lenses out of it. I, I just, oh, I guess, yes, that's perhaps it. you could. <laughs> okay, we've had, it was a beautiful lecture and we've managed to, we've, we've had a little uh, a deviation into uh, um, the uh, origin of the eye. Um, and um, we've, uh, it, it's just fascinating how many aspects of science at play here and uh, it's extraordinary how much we uh, if i have to put this the right way we've learned so much from your lecture but, oh, thank you. but at the same time I have a sense that there's more to learn and i've learned so much from the questions there's always more to learn and i also want to thank you for indulging me and allowing me to talk about art which is my passion and i never get to talk about this <laughs> we enjoyed that as well but thank you very much it's a beautiful thank lecture you.